Welcome to Vegas History for Locals. I'm Alan Rogers. I was raised here in Las Vegas, and there's a few things that I love. I love I love the food that we have here in Las Vegas. I love technology. I love history, and I really, really do love Las Vegas. I love where we live. I really didn't appreciate it until I grew up a bit and started traveling and comparing the stories that I had uh, to people who grew up in, well, less awesome places to grow up in. I realized that buck 99 steak and eggs after midnight was not a thing for other people. I also learned that, you know, slot machines are not in the grocery stores and that, um, and that, you know, high school jobs for other people are working at McDonald's and things. And people from Las Vegas all have crazy, weird high school jobs. And, you know, I just I have loved growing up here. And what I want to do is tell some of the stories of how Las Vegas came to be what it is. I think we're very interesting. We have a very interesting culture here in Las Vegas. We have an outsized influence on the culture of America at large. And I want to explore, you know, how that came to be. One of the things also I've seen is that this town has grown insanely since I've been here. When I was born, there were around a half million people. Now there are uh, more than 2.25 million people in this in this valley. And one of the things I love to do when I meet people here in Las Vegas, I like to ask them three questions. I like to ask them, why did you move to Las Vegas? Then I like to ask them what they thought of it when they first moved here. And then I like to ask them, you know, what is your your story that could have only happened in Las Vegas? Now, Las Vegas, the culture of the people has not had a strong identity. Uh, you know, we, everybody, when they think of Las Vegas, they think of the casinos, they think of the shows, they think of those things, but they don't really think about the people who inhabit this valley. And I think it's because, you know, we're all from different places. Most of the people who are in Las Vegas immigrated from somewhere else, uh, somewhere else in the United States, whether they're escaping, you know, high taxes and high cost of living in California, or they're escaping the, the cold and came here from Chicago. You know, we've all come from somewhere else. And because of that, I think we don't have a very cohesive culture. And one of the things I think we can do is we can tell these stories. We can bring these stories together to, to be able to kind of have a shared identity and to have these shared heroes. One of the things that actually inspired this is my friend, Mike Solkowski. He runs a, uh, a, a podcast called uh, Come and Take It. It's, a, it's a, the history of Texas. And, you know, one of the things listening to that, I've realized that they – they have a lot of pride regarding the pioneers who founded their their communities, all of the different industries and all of those uh, all of those things that make Texas a very unique society. In fact, my my brother built a bunch of homes down in Texas. And when he was there, he said he was just blown away by how proud Texans are of their of their local culture. And I want to inspire the, the same thing in Las Vegas. I want to start telling some of our stories and um, and make people proud of where they're from. In fact, one of the friends I went to high school with, she actually tells people she's from Tennessee rather than telling them she's from Las Vegas because she thinks it's kind of a trashy place to grow up in. What I want to do is I want to tell these stories, and make Las Vegans proud of where we're at. And so I'm going to start to introduce some of the characters and some of the places and some of the industries um, that make Las Vegas unique and that impact the culture today. And I'm going to do that, you know, by telling these stories. And I got to warn you, I'm not a professional. I'm not a historian. I'm a technology nerdy guy. Uh, I just like to read these stories. And so sometimes they might not be accurate. Please let me know if I'm not. Please leave comments and things like that. I'm always learning about this history. I'm also going to be using a long form format. So I'm going to be um, talking for uh, you know, these are not going to be little five minute buzz clip articles. These are going to be longer discussions. Also, I like to learn through pictures and maps and relating some of these old histories to, to places that we know today. And so um, I'm going to be doing that through Google Earth. So please go ahead and, and join along. Um, I have a link in the uh, description that uh, links to the Google Earth file so that you can you can explore these places as, as we go through it. Now, the first person that I think we should be talking about and the first and, and a name that I think should be a household name in Las Vegas is of one of our pioneer founders, Helen J. Stewart. Now, Helen J. Stewart was uh, an amazing and an absolutely remarkable woman. She was one of the first non-native settlers who um, stayed here in the valley and who didn't get chewed up and spit out by this harsh climate that we exist in. 
Uh, she was supposed to just move here for a year, which talking to people from uh, a lot of people who live in Las Vegas, a lot of people come here thinking, oh, it's just going to be a year or two. And then they end up falling in love with the place. They fall in love with the weirdness and, you know, the opportunities that Las Vegas brings. And Helen J. Stewart was able to take these opportunities and run with them and become a very, very powerful person. Um, you know, her background gave her these unique abilities to become the mistress of the trail that we're going to be talking about and to found this, this city and to kind of guide it in its infancy uh, to becoming a world-class city. Now, I'm going to be using a couple of sources here uh, that I really am a big fan of. Now, most of what I talk about is going to be really coming straight from this book. It's called Helen J. Stewart, The First Lady of Las Vegas. It's by Sally Zanjani and Carrie Townley Porter. Absolutely fantastic book. It's only about 10 years old. I recommend picking it up. Um, if you really want to have a good time, go to the Old Mormon Fort and, and buy it there or the uh, Nevada History Museum. I've seen it for sale there. Um, it's a wonderful book that, that goes into great detail about what Helen J. Stewart did. I'm also going to be using a lot of the pictures from UNLV Special Collections, and I'm going to be using uh, a lot of the pictures that come from Vintage Las Vegas, which is a wonderful website that has tons and tons of Las Vegas, Vegas historical pictures in it. So let's go ahead and jump in and talk about Helen J. Stewart, and why uh, why everybody in Las Vegas should know who she is. So Helen was born in uh, Springfield, Illinois in the 1850s, around the time when Abraham Lincoln was practicing law there in Springfield and getting his start. Now, uh, when she was about six years old, she moved to uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. Now, St. Joseph is an interesting place because it was at the very end of that railroad line. So it was kind of the end of civilization at that time. In fact, what her dad did was he sold the the um, uh, he would sell all the equipment and supplies that people would need to um, go overland and go either to Oregon or um, to California. You know, those are the main the main places that people were hopping off to from. And Helen was able to be here during a very interesting time in the 1860s. This was before Kansas was a state. And there were tons of skirmishes over this border between Kansas and Missouri because uh, Kansas, there was a big debate whether Kansas would be a slave state or a free state. When Kansas was admitted to the Union, suddenly there was a civil war. And that happened when Helen was, you know, seven or eight years old. And I can't imagine, you know, the the, the conversations she heard and the, the, you know, the excitement around there. In fact, uh, you know, during the Civil War, which, you know, kicked off while Helen was here, they, there were actually skirmishes. And the Missouri bushwhackers came in and actually raided St. Joseph. So she saw that she was here during a very tumultuous time. It was a, it was a very interesting time to be here. And, um, you know, at a certain point, her dad decided like, you know, there's this violence here, the civil war, and I've been, you know, outfitting these people to go to California. Why don't we go ahead and, and head to California ourselves? And so they did, uh, they took this overland trail, uh, you know, this, this, I just can't imagine doing this either. This was, this was the time, you know, if you played the Oregon trail game, I hope you didn't get dysentery, but, uh, this was one of the things that that would happen is the, this, they, they would go through this California trail. And during this time, this, you know, multi-month journey, um, the, 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 the wiser family, their, their, uh, horses got sick and they got stuck here in Fort Churchill, Nevada. So Nevada was still a territory at this time. It was actually just a year before Nevada would become a state. And Helen and her family got stuck on the trail here for a bunch of weeks. And I think this is going to be interesting later in Helen's life because she is going to be kind of sitting there on a busy trail watching all these people come and go. And she got her first taste of Nevada and the harsh environment of Nevada here in, uh, in Fort Churchill. And, uh, and she got her first life of what it was like to be that stop on the trail. Now, eventually her family, they were able to successfully get down into uh, California. Uh, they settled uh, south of Sacramento in a, in a place called Galt. And, uh, you know, it was a farming community. And they did, they, they, they went and were farmers for a little while. But then Helen's dad, he decided his name was Hiram. He decided he wanted to become a prospector. And uh, this was you know, years after the uh, gold rush of 49. But there were still a lot of mining claims that were happening all over this community, all over the place. And so Helen was 
you know, left with her brothers and sisters and her mother uh, to fend for themselves. And Helen was able to receive an education. Uh, Helen's mother was very, very serious about her children receiving an education. In fact, Helen uh, was sent away to college at Hesperian College in Woodland, uh, you know, outside of Sacramento in um, 1867. So when she was like 13 or 14, she was sent away to get her education. And this is where she learned things like, uh, you know, the classics, poetry, uh, math, and the sciences that were available then. So it was the Victorian period. So think about these, you know, these women wearing lace and, and, uh, and you know, these big dresses uh, going to college here. In uh, in this little in this little college outside of Sacramento. So after she received her education, uh, she got married. At 19 years old, she met this man named Archibald Stewart. He was uh, 40 years old, so almost twice her age. Um, he was a well-established uh, gentleman, and they really did fall in love with each other, which was very nice for the Victorian times, because sometimes people were just married for um, you know, family connections or, or to get money and things like that. But uh, Archibald and Helen were really in love, and you know, we, have, we have letters that talk about how much she liked his wavy hair and things like that. And, you know, they were so he was in Stockton, but they didn't stay in, in Stockton, California, very long. Um, they packed up their belongings pretty quickly and headed out to this place called Pony Springs. Pony Springs is about 30 miles north of of Pioch in Nevada. And they, they came out here because Archibald wanted to try his hand at prospecting. He wanted to to make it big, too, uh, with the gold. But. Actually, I think it was more silver in this place because we are the silver state. And now, uh, Helen, when she was moved out here, she was pretty miserable. Uh, she did not enjoy living in Pony Springs because she was all alone. This is when they actually had conceived their first kid and um, had William. Now, when it was time to deliver William, they did go down to Pioch to to have the baby. And that's when Ellen realized that she needed to be in civilization. She really missed the company of other people, especially the company of other women. And so, um, you know, a few years after they moved to Pony Springs, uh, they decided to move down to the main city of Pioch. Now, Pioch is a is an interesting place. If you live in Las Vegas, I really, really recommend that you take a, a trip up to Pioch. In the 1870s, it was known as one of the most lawless places in America. Uh, you know, they said that they had more than 70 deaths due to homicide in this in this town of, you know, I think it was a couple thousand people by, in the 1870s. So if you go up there today, you can boot the, uh, visit the Boot Hill Cemetery where on all the headstones, they describe how these people were killed in the 1870s. It's really, really interesting about, you know, over a dog and, and stuff like that. You There's the Gem Theater. There's the Overland Hotel, which is this, this old haunted hotel that you can go hang out with. Go to Pioch. It's a really, really interesting place. So. Um, when they moved to Pioch, Archibald kind of changed positions. He started uh, uh, selling equipment. And at the time, Pioch was kind of shrinking. A lot of these uh, mining mining claims were being tapped out. And uh, Archibald was making his money, but he made more money off of selling supplies than he did uh, from his prospecting. He also started dabbling in, uh, in investments, and he invested in a gentleman named Octavius Gass, who came to Pioch asking for money. Now, Octavius Gass, he was running a little ranch in this dusty part of Nevada called Las Vegas, and he had to borrow some money because he'd fallen on hard times. And so Archibald lent him this money. But, you know, a little while later, Gass defaulted on that loan. And since uh, Pioch was rapidly declining at that time in the 18 in the early 1880s, um, you know, Archibald looked at his family and they'd had um, uh, some more children since they uh, came to Pioch as well. Uh, they had, you know, two more children. Um, they had Tiza and, and, and Hiram named after her father. So, you know, now they're a family of five out here in Pioch. And they've got to learn how, you know, they've got to figure out what the next move is. They made this investment in, in Las Vegas, and it was time to save that investment because gas was going to default on his loans. So they, they packed up their family and they decided to take that dusty trip and, and move down to Las Vegas. So this is a around 180 mile journey 
to get down to Las Vegas. And you have to remember at the time that, you know, through horse and carriage, and this is a family of five moving through this, these dusty places, you could only make around 20 miles a day. So it was, you know, a good week long journey um, to get from Pioche down to Las Vegas. And what did Helen and her family see when they came to Las Vegas? They see, they saw something like this. This is a picture of what the gas farm looked like about the time that Helen J. Stewart um, uh, came into town. Now, you know, Pioche, we think of Pioche as a little tiny place, but back in 1882, when Helen J. Stewart moved to town, uh, Pioche was giant compared to Las Vegas. Las Vegas just had a, a, a handful of, of people, um, a very, very small number of white settlers and mostly Native Americans. In fact, I want to talk about kind of what Helen J. Stewart had moved into at this time uh, and talk about the people who came before because there's some very interesting uh, uh, stories here. So the first group of people that we need to talk about were the original inhabitants of, of the Las Vegas Valley, the, the Southern Paiutes. Now, the Southern Paiutes, they had this, uh, you know, they had this large range where, um, you know, the, through southern Nevada, northern Arizona, and um, and southern Utah, uh, this this is where the Paiutes th lived. Now, the Paiutes were, compared to a lot of their neighbors, um, they were a very, very poor band of, of Native Americans. Um, in fact, the Utes would come and often and actually um, take the Southern Paiute children and, and take them into slavery. The Shoshone were uh, much more calorie sufficient and had a much larger culture and much larger society. And in Las Vegas in the 1850s, they say that there were only around 1,200 Native inhabitants uh, or, or, or so around that time. And the Native Americans here, they had a rough go of it. Um, you know, they were quite migratory. They didn't live in the Las Vegas Valley because it was just too hot. Now, we have to remember that that humans have been able to live in places that have been colder for a long time because we knew how to, you know, we created fire and we could make cold places warm. But back in the, these times, you know, there was no way of making a hot place cooler except for evaporative technology. They had some very, very, you know, rudimentary ways of, of helping do that. And this was one of the most extreme places in the entire world, right? Part of the range of the, the Southern Paiutes was Death Valley. And Death Valley is the hottest place in the entire world. So think about just this dry place, very hot. It was all about the springs. And the whole reason anybody lived in the Las Vegas Valley was the fact that there were these artesian springs that just that sprung up everywhere. In fact, even today in, in Las Vegas, um, you know, the, the, the water table is is very, very low. In fact, some of the places on the strip, like where the Luxor is built and where the Mandalay Bay is built, um, you know, if you go underground, it's just a, a few feet until you start hitting hitting water. In fact, some hotels are sinking into the ground uh, because of the amount of water that we have underneath um, Las Vegas. And Las Vegas got its name for that. It was called the Meadows because we had this giant, uh, we had really, really tall grass that actually grew naturally around all these springs. And so the Native Americans, you know, they would congregate around these springs. It was required for life. That's where, the, that's where they would find things. But it was a very calorie poor situation. They it was just really hard to find enough to eat. Um, the ground was so alkali and, and, and so difficult to, to, um, plant in that they, um, that the Southern Paiute did not plant a lot of, a lot of crops. In fact, when, um, settlers came through, they actually improved conditions by bringing some of these, uh, some crops in. Now to exacerbate this idea that, you know, the, the Utes next door were, you know, were, were harvesting slaves from, from the, the Southern Paiutes. They also had a super busy, well, I guess it wasn't super busy, but you know, this, this big road that was going right through, uh, the Valley and it's called the, the, um, the old Mormon trail or the old Spanish trail before that. Now, yeah, again, when, when we talk about Helen J. Stewart, when she moved in, in, it was called the Old Mormon Trail. But it was this this trail when when the Mormons used it that followed all the springs. And you can kind of see all of the springs that 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 um, that followed all the way down from Salt Lake um, to mostly to San Bernardino. So the Mormons had settled a lot of Utah uh, during the 1840s and 1850s, 1860s. So. They, uh, Brigham Young wanted to create a settlement every 20 miles uh, from Salt Lake City to San Bernardino, which was the other major Mormon settlement. 
And, uh, you know, there were some parts of the trail that were much, much rougher than others. In fact, if you look at here, there was this there was quite a, a, a big difference between Las Vegas and Moapa, where the, these two springs uh, were, were very far away from each other. Now, back before the Mormons used this trail, it was used uh, for, for Spanish traders who were trading goods between Los Angeles and Santa Fe, New Mexico. So these people would make this pilgrimage and it was in, it was used as far back as the 1770s. This was an established trade route. And when, um, you know, these these traders would take all their goods from Santa Fe, bring them over to Los Angeles on the way home from Los Angeles to um, back to Santa Fe. They would actually take a lot of the Paiutes with them as slaves and and bring them with them, which, again, exacerbated the the population issue. So this old, um, you know, this old Spanish trail was one of the distinguishing features of the Las Vegas Valley when Helen J. Stewart moved into town. And you can see here's an old dusty shot of that uh, of that Spanish trail uh, going past Red Rock Canyon. So one of the other inhabitants of, of Las Vegas and the, and the people who really decided that this was going to be the place where Las Vegas started were the Mormons. So the Mormons were called to a mission again. Uh, Brigham Young wanted to establish the, the the those outposts every twenty miles or so, and he called a Mormon mission in uh, 1855. And so all these guys had to come. You know, they didn't really volunteer. They were they were told, "Hey, you're going to go to Las Vegas and settle this place." So they came in 1855, in June of 1855, and they and they um, set things up. They found this little creek, the Las Vegas Creek, and you know. They they made this lot that last 50 miles of the old Spanish trail that last 50 miles. There's there's 50 miles where there's absolutely no water. And if we think back to it, there you can only really cover 20 miles in a day. So by the time they reached Las Vegas, um, their cattle and their horses were dying of thirst. In fact, they had to send people ahead. And the first substantial source of water they found was this Las Vegas Creek right here on Las Vegas Boulevard in Washington today. And they had to send people back to, to, to shell the water. I mean, it was really, really hard even just to get here, get to this place. And then when the Mormons uh, settled here, uh, you know, they had a rough go of it. Uh, it was very, very difficult to plant crops. They did set up a fort in kind of that Spanish uh, the Spanish mission style where you had um, a military base to uh, reject any Indian attacks or Native American attacks. They didn't really have to worry about that. Um, but so they, they spent all this time creating these adobe bricks, put this fort together and then started to um, to plant crops and irrigate. And they did that. And at first they had a little bit of success, um, but a lot of things didn't grow there. And it was just extremely hot uh when they started growing things and they tried to plant things as soon as they got there a lot of those things just burned up and, and didn't grow um when their families came down the next year uh they realized that they just could not make enough food to support themselves and there was some other drama with mount potosi and stuff like that we'll actually talk about that in a future episode about about the mormons history here but they didn't last very long they only lasted around two years uh before they decided that they'd had enough and they decided to leave and so after they left, you know, we had the the, the next uh, resident of, of this area and, you know, and we were going to talk about Octavius Gas. He's the guy who went to uh, Pioch to, to ask for money. So Octavius Gas was a 49er um, who ended up in El Dorado Canyon, which was a place um, that got pretty busy because of mining. There was a lot of gold and silver mining that happened down in El Dorado Canyon. And, uh, you know, he passed through the valley and realized that there was this, you know, this old abandoned fort. And, you know, the, the people in El Dorado Canyon, they needed to eat and there was really no source of food or anything near it. So uh, gas started um, ranching and farming at the old uh, Vegas fort. He actually lived there for about 20 years with his family and he did a lot better than the Mormons did. He um, expanded upon the the, the, the farming. He had a, a successful ranching operation and started that trade route between El Dorado Canyon and his farm here in Las Vegas. Uh, in fact, there's this great picture of Octavius Gas in front of, of his house. And we see here, here's the old Las Vegas Creek. 
and we can see his Adobe structure here. And in the back, this structure is still exists in Las Vegas today. Uh, this is that Adobe structure at the, uh, at the back of the fort. In fact, if I close this down, we should see that little smokestack is that same here. So, you know, and the main house was right here, right? Right. Almost on Las Vegas Boulevard, right where the right where the trail passed. Right. So Octavius Gas lived here for about 20 years. But at the end, uh, he just couldn't make it. There were a couple of rough seasons that um, and the Native Americans, they would they would take a lot of his food uh, because the alternative was starving to death. And, you know, Octavius Gas, he worked with the Native Americans pretty well until it became a problem where he just wasn't able to make ends meet. And that's when he went up to Pioch and took out that loan so that hopefully he could, um, uh, you know, hopefully he could continue this venture. But he he lost it. He lost the ranch and he actually ended up moving to Arizona and becoming a legislator and all sorts of interesting things that, that he did later in life. Um, but he he couldn't make Las Vegas work. It was just too harsh an environment. And, um, and he ended up abandoning it. And that's when, that's what Helen J. Stewart walked into. Now I do want to talk about some of the neighbors that Helen had when she came into Las Vegas. And the first one I want to talk about is her neighbors and, and her main customers right down here in El Dorado Canyon. Um, El Dorado Canyon was a mining community. There were hundreds of people down here. Um, even it got up to thousands at, at certain points during, um, during this time. And El Dorado Canyon was a rough place. It was a lawless place. There was nobody collecting taxes down here. Uh, there was no law. Uh, it was just a bunch of, a bunch of men out here in the middle of the desert, digging around in rocks, trying to find silver and gold. And, um, it, but it was a, it was a really, really busy place. And that's what, this is really going to be the, the main way that Helen J. Stewart and her family are going to survive is by trading with all of these, uh, prospectors, um, down in, in El Dorado Canyon. And if you go there today, in fact, if you've have any photographer friends or you've probably seen pictures of people um, with this as the background. It's a really fun place to go visit. Um, in fact, you know, my dad's friend kind of reestablished the place, brought in all these old buildings, and it's a really, really beautiful place to go visit. But boy, is it hot there. I just can't imagine being one of the miners down there in the uh, in the 18, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. Another um, uh, neighbor that, that we had at the time uh, in fact, the closest neighbors, they moved in around seven years before the Stewart family would come to Las Vegas. And they were the Kyle family. Uh, Conrad Kyle, he was an old dude in his, in his 70s. Um, he'd moved out to Las Vegas on a spring that was only about a mile and a half uh, away from, from where the Stewarts would be setting up camp. And he was known to employ a lot of interesting characters. So again, Las Vegas is in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's no law here and uh, just a couple of settlers. And Las Vegas was known as a place where if you were in trouble with the law, you could come to the Kyle Ranch and get a job and hide out from the law and wait for things to blow over. So, you know, you had all these ruffians who ran and this was not a farming operation. They ran they ran a farm or I mean, they ran a, a ranch and they were all ranchers um, herding cattle and moving, moving horses and things like that. And they were a rough and tumbled bunch. The Kyle brothers, uh, the Kyle boys, they also have um, and it, that that Kyle name might sound familiar if you're uh, familiar with the canyons around Las Vegas. One, you know, back in. Back at this time in Las Vegas, if you needed lumber, if you needed wood to build your houses, I mean, lumber was like, you know, the main uh, building material at the time, but none of it was in Las Vegas. There were no big trees back then here, right? It was the meadows. It was just a bunch of, of big, tall grass. And so the Kyles, they ran a uh, farming operation up there called Kyle Canyon. And if you've been in Vegas for a while, that's, you know, the main canyon that you think of when you think of going to Mount Charleston. So they had a lumber operation up here in Mount Charleston. So think about coming out to, uh, you know, every time you need to go get wood, having to come all the way out to Mount Charleston. That was a multiple day journey uh, to get out there. Then you had to cut down the logs, process them, put them on your wagon, and then bring them all the way back to Las Vegas. So wood was a very, very precious commodity in Las Vegas at the very beginning. And the uh, the Kyle family, you know, they, they helped establish that. So the other um, 
uh, non-native inhabitants of Las Vegas Valley. Uh, were, well, they weren't really in the valley. They were out there in Red Rock Canyon uh, at the, the Sandstone Ranch. And it was a, a gentleman named Jim Wilson. So Jim Wilson was a, uh, a soldier who was stationed at Fort Mojave during the, uh, the Civil War, and he fell in love with the area when he was passing through. Uh, Fort Mojave was at the very, very tippy bottom of, of Nevada. And, uh, you know, he went through Red Rock Canyon and he just loved the area. And so he created his sandstone ranch up there uh, near Red Rock Canyon. He had two um, half Paiute boys that that uh, he claimed and he was, you know, and he had a pretty happy life out here. Again, he was ranching, mostly doing cattle and, and things like that and living right at the at the bottom of Red Rock Canyon. Uh, you know, he must had he just had one of the best views out there and ran his little operation with his sons. Now, if you go up there today, Spring Mountain Park, you've probably seen Super Summer Theater. If you're from Las Vegas, that's where, uh, you know, we have that outdoor amphitheater and it's just a beautiful place. And his uh, his ranch is, is still out there and it's or his cabin. And it's a really, really neat place to visit. In fact, if you look over here on the left, these are some of the grapes and they're actually um, related to the uh, uh, their cuttings from the original grapes that were that were uh, grown at the old Mormon fort. So I don't know. It's kind of a, a nice little fact is is those grapes are, are pretty OG for Las Vegas. <laughs> so, you know, those were the neighbors. He, uh, he had El Dorado Canyon. You had the Kyles, you had Jim Wilson. You actually had one other gentleman who was a coal uh, miner around 10 miles away from, from the, um, from the Stewart ranch. And it was 1882 when they, when they rolled in 1882, just in context, that's the time when uh, Billy, the kid was doing his thing. That's when the uh, shootout of the OK Corral was happening, but also when the um, Brooklyn bridge was being, being built. So still old wild West, especially out here. Um, but you know, but, technology and things were improving in, in the United States and, and there was rapid industrialization in other parts of the country. So Helen and her family, they moved in and, um, and, and settled down. And one of the first things that happened was, you know, this family of five, uh, they became a family of six. So before Helen left Pioch, she knew she was pregnant and she actually went and had to talk to the doctor and said, listen, I'm going down into the middle of nowhere and I need to learn how to deliver my baby. And so he gave her some pointers. Uh, it just, uh, again, thinking about going down into, uh, you know, into the middle of nowhere, there were no doctors around, uh, nobody to help. Uh, and she thought she was going to be all on her own to have this baby. Um, but you know, the good news is, is that she was able to have her baby. And this is Eveline La Vega Stewart. La Vega for Las Vegas to, to recognize their new home. And Helen did have some help though, uh, in it, with, uh, having this child, there were the Paiute women who were around, uh, who Helen was able to have an amazing relationship with, with. In fact, I think this is one of the definitive relationships between, you know, some of these people, Helen J. Stewart was always really kind to the, uh, to the native Americans there. Uh, she would employ them often. And, uh, one of the things she would do is she would trade with them instead of giving out food. She always said, Hey, I will um, trade you food and I'll, I'll trade you these, these items for baskets. And she started to collect a lot of these baskets from the Paiute women and she respected them and, and she learned from them and, and, um, and learned how to survive in this hot, dusty place, this place that so many other people couldn't learn how to, uh, how to live in. So the Stewart family, they settled in and they started to, um, you know, to, to get used to their new life here in Las Vegas. Uh, you know, part of the, the half of their job was, was the farming. And again, they were, they inherited a lot from gas. Um, the soil was still awful and they had to work so, so hard, uh, composting and things like that to get the soil to actually, you know, to grow anything. Uh, here we see some of the orchard and I think this was actually taken way later, but, uh, we see the orchards that they were dealing with. So they would grow all these fruits and vegetables, um, you know, and also do a lot of the ranching cattle and, and horse ranching. And then they would, um, send it down to El Dorado Canyon, which, was a couple days journey. And that was, you know, that was the, the patterns of life there. 
they they grew grapes and they actually used to ferment their own wine. And there's some funny stories about how every time the wine would get fermented, that uh, <laughs> that there would be no work being done for a couple of months because everybody was laid up, inebriated. Um, but and they you know lived on this little place in Las Vegas where on this on this busy uh, you know old Mormon trail and they would constantly be having visitors staying in and they would, they would always, you know, as soon as you came over apex, uh, the most noticeable feature of the Valley was the Stewart ranch, you know, in this, in this, in this dark or this, this dusty desert, uh, there were suddenly all these trees and, you know, you could see a house. And so everybody who came through town would stop at the Stewart ranch. So they were constantly had people um, over for dinner and and people that they were entertaining. So they were going through these and, and, and doing pretty well in Las Vegas. And then something happened in July of 1884. By the way, uh, you know, a couple years in, Helen is pregnant with her uh, fifth child and they uh, and, and they're and and. and Archibald is down in El Dorado Canyon. Uh, he had been doing some trading down there at El Dorado Canyon and Helen J. Stewart was dealing with the ranch hand and the ranch hand accused her of ripping him off and said all sorts of nasty things to her. Right. So um, Archibald, he gets back from his trip to El Dorado Canyon and Helen says, hey, there was a dust up. You know, I had words with this ranch hand who is living with the Kyles, who's, you know, one of the Kyle uh, ranchers. And, um, you know, Archibald heard about that and he decided to, to take care of it in, in the way that it was taking care of in those days. He wanted to go have a conversation and defend his wife's honor. So he got on his horse, you know, right after he got back from El Dorado Canyon, he jumps on his horse, you know, goes the mile and a half down the street to, uh, uh, to the Kyle camp and uh, he never comes back. We don't know exactly what happened, but uh, well, we know that, that uh, Helen received a note later that night and the note read, Mrs. Stewart, send a team and take Mr. Stewart away. He is dead. Conrad kill Kyle. And so she did. She, um, well, she, she actually went down herself and uh, saw her husband under the blanket and, and they really did a number on him. He had multiple gunshot wounds. Uh, he was, uh, he'd been bashed across the face with a rifle. Um, the, you know, some of the, 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 the shots happened very, very close to his face and she was outraged. Um, you know, she took her husband, took his body, put him on a, 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 a little cart and brought him back to the old Mormon fort, the, the Stewart ranch. And I, I just can't imagine that. I can't imagine. So put yourself in Helen J. Stewart's shoes. It's, you know, she's 30 years old, right? She's lived here for a couple of years. She was only supposed to live here for one year. Archibald told her, hey, we're going to go down. We're going to turn around our investment. We're going to sell the ranch. We're going to make all of our money. And then we're going to get out of here so you can get back to civilization. Helen hated being alone. And she was all alone here in this valley. She was even more alone now because her husband had been killed by her only neighbors. These guys who lived a mile and a half up the street. She was worried that they would come and finish the job. So she didn't know what to do. She has four children, um, you know, a year old baby. And then the, her oldest was nine. So all these small children, she, uh, she, she is, you know, this little Victorian lady. She was also very physically diminutive, diminutive. She was about five feet tall, hundred pounds. She was just this skinny little thing that was expected to now survive in one of the harshest places in the world to live a place that a lot of people couldn't make work and she had to make a decision i mean i'm thinking about that night sitting there you know also it's july in las vegas and i just can't imagine the heat and being uncomfortable being pregnant and having all of these children around and not knowing what to do you know, on one hand, what do you do? Do you go back to your family and, and give up on this on this investment? Uh, you know, do you do you continue here? And what does that look like even? Uh, what how is this going to work with with these murderous people who are living right up the street? 
And this is when Helen had to make a decision for herself. She, and again, that night, you know, with her husband's body uh, sitting there, actually in, you know, they, they she put it in the river to, to try to preserve it and keep it cool. And she had to decide whether she was going to stay or if she was going to go. And that's when she decided to stay. So, and I like this little view. This is, this is uh, where the Helen J the, the, the ranch house was back in the day. And you can see here, you know, just to the right is, is Las Vegas Boulevard. And on the left is the natural history museum. And there's that little Las Vegas Creek with the trees around it. And, um, you know, she had to make that decision of, of, you know, what do I do? And she decided at that point that she was going to give it a go, that she was going to stay, that she was going to continue running the operations, try to make some money off of this property, turn around and get back into civilization. And this is where I think Helen J. Stewart becomes a great woman. This is where she, you know, she takes up her, her, uh, her, she she takes her life in her hands and, and she takes her fate and decides to become either, you know, someone who's going to fail out here in Las Vegas or somebody who's going to be a great person. And Helen, you know, because we're talking about her, spoiler alert, she becomes one of those great people. And so, you know, after her husband's death, Helen had to do some work. Uh, the first thing she had to do, she had to go back up to Pioche again, 180 miles to get back up to Pioche and go uh, uh, across the street from where she used to live in f their house. When they lived in Pioche was right across the street from the million dollar courthouse. And there were a couple of things that she wanted to do. She wanted to, uh, to prosecute her husband's killers and get justice for him. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. It took years. They, they had to find the guy and then put him up for trial. And there was a mistrial and all that stuff. Um, nobody was punished for the death of, of Archibald Stewart. And she also had to fight tooth and nail to get the deed to get what was owed to her. I mean, there was a will and everything, but they, um, the people around her here tried to take Helen's property away from her, saying that there's no way that she could manage it on her own and there's no way that she could be successful. And so she had to find character witnesses and, and go through all these hoops in order to even get to legally own that, that land so that she could go and, and, and sell it later. And um, this is the time and, and everybody in Pioche thought she was crazy for even trying to do this. They, they expected her to fail and they thought it was kind of a joke what she was trying to do. Now, at this time, she uh, she sends back and talks to her dad and, and he actually comes out. So good old Hiram, the old prospector, the guy who's, you know, who came across America, uh, comes down to Las Vegas to help his daughter out. And together, um, you know, they they really make Las Vegas, uh, the, this Las Vegas ranch, they make it become more and more successful. Um, it wasn't always easy, uh, but she got it there. So I love this picture of Las Vegas. This kind of shows that old Mormon trail uh, passing through, passing next to the Stewart Ranch. Uh, this was a little bit later when they had more, uh, more buildings on it. But uh, you can just see how desolate and how, how lonely of a place that was to live. So, you know, Helen came here and, and she, she went to business. They continued to do the farming. Uh, they continued to do the ranching. And she raised her children out in the middle of nowhere. Now, one of the stories about Helen J. Stewart that I think is indicative of what Las Vegas has become today is about hospitality. Now, even today, there's really no reason for anyone to ever come to this part of the world, right? It's a, it's a really, really hot place. I'm recording this in July. It's going to be 110 degrees, uh, you know, this, this, this weekend. Um, there is really no reason. And that, and it's not like it's like on a major thoroughfare or anything there's no reason for all these people to come uh to las vegas today except for our hospitality we know how to treat better, people better than anywhere else in the world and helen j stewart was the first she would often she we there were stories about um you know you would actually see the dust cloud before you saw any of the people come and she'd see the dust cloud off in apex and see these people coming in and she would put the, the tea kettle on and, and start up dinner. Uh, Helen never knew how many people she was going to be hosting for dinner uh, with all the native Americans hanging around a ranch with all the ranch hands and the, the hired help. And then the people who were passing by, um, it was always a big question of how many people uh, she should make dinner for. But she was known as a gracious uh, uh, host. She was known for 
for a few things. First of all, she was known for being able to size people up really well. She was a great judge of character. Everybody said that she could uh, she could tell the bad guys from the good guys really early and had the bad people move on. And the good people could stay for as long as they wanted. She was also famous for um, making people stay for longer than they anticipated. <laughs> You know, after that, they would get through that 50 mile journey with no water. They would get there and their their horses were emaciated. Everything was in a rough condition. And she uh, would say, hey, come here and stay and, and recover. And then she was such a great conversational since she was so starved for attention and starved for you know society that uh, she would she would talk to them. And she was, apparently had the gift of gab. She was uh, a great conversationalist, again, educated and smart. And people just loved talking to her. And they would stay multiple days just because of how gracious and wonderful of a host she was. Which again, I think is really what Las Vegas is all about. This crazy place in the desert that you stay at because you know it's a, it's got some amazing things to to experience. Another thing that she did was you know these folks who would come in, she would do horse trading with them, and and uh, you know these horses when they got there and these the livestock when they got to Las Vegas were in such a, a bad condition that uh, Helen would say, hey. These look rough, but I'll take them off your hands for a, you know, for a fair price. And I'll sell you these other ones that I've rehabilitated from the, the people who came before you. And so she was able to make, um, you know, quite a bit of money and, and, and had quite a herd, uh, it, you know, that she was able to leverage for more and more cash. And, and, and this is how she was able to really start to excel, excel, you know, both the trade with El Dorado and the, um, you know, the visitors and the horse trading, uh, she was able to do pretty, pretty well for herself. Now, one of the things that, that she liked to talk about was, was how she did engage with the uh, native Americans, with the, you know, the, the original inhabitants of Las Vegas. Um, here's actually a picture of one of the girls who worked on the Helen J. Stewart ranch and, and one of the couples who worked with her. And so Helen J. Stewart had to deal with a very diverse group of individuals. Um, you know, one of the early settlers of Las Vegas, it was actually a, a black guy who lived out at, um, uh, the spring Mount, well, Springs preserve where that is at the big spring, you know, she had Jim Wilson with his half native American sons. And then she had all of the Paiutes around. And then she had all these, you know, these travelers coming through and it must've been a very interesting experience or must've been a, an interesting, um, confluence of people where, you know, all these different races, all these different ethnicities were coming together and, and working to try to make Las Vegas into, you know, make Las Vegas successful. Uh, again, a lot of people had not made it very successful. And, and you know, by working together, they, they really did. And if you look at Las Vegas today, it's one of the most diverse cities in the United States. Um, and all these people are working together to make this mirage in the desert, you know, a reality. One of the people who uh, ended who worked at the uh, Stewart Ranch uh, bears uh, mention is his name was Little Mouse, and this is a place named after him called Mouse's Tank. And if you've ever been to uh, the Valley of Fire, you might have seen the Mouse's Tank um, uh, trail. Now, Little Mouse was a uh, she was, he was a hand on the Stewart Ranch, um, but he was also known for being he was a really really smart guy, but he also would steal things from people. And uh, he was actually accused of murder. He, they say that he killed uh, two prospectors as well. And so he had to go on the run. And the place that he decided to, ha to uh, hide out was the Valley of Fire. And this was Mouse's Tank where, um, you know, he would hang out around this area that, always, that usually had water in it. Uh, so they had access to water, but he could still hide out really well. Now, unfortunately, uh, the posse did catch up with with little mouse and uh, and then they they lynched him. So that was a, a sad thing. But Helen was, again, at the, at the nexus of everything that was happening in the in the area. Everybody came through uh, Las Vegas. And then let's talk about number five, Stuart Child, number five. And this is Archie Stewart. Now, Archie was named after his father, of course, who he never got to meet. Um, and Archibald was uh, the apple of Helen's eye and she doted on him and just absolutely loved him. Apparently he was a really good baby, a really easy baby. And, um, and we have lots of pictures of thing and things uh, when he was a kid and it, it, she was just really, really happy to have her little family out there, you know, a family of five in the middle of the desert and uh, a cute little baby uh, bringing up the rear. So 
you know, one of the things that, that she she was concerned about, though, was her edu- was education. And, uh, you know, part of the of the statue of Helen J. Stewart down at the old Mormon fort is, you know, it does show the books because, again, she her parents took education seriously. He, she was educated and she was raising her kids out in the middle of the desert and didn't know what she uh, what what how to how she was going to educate them. And so she did find somebody. She found a uh, a gentleman, an Irishman, McGarrigal, uh, and he uh, he also had the gift of gab. And he came down and, and educated the uh, Stewart children for a few years. Uh, he lived there on the ranch. He became uh, integral to the whole Las Vegas Valley and was quite a character. Um, but unfortunately, he didn't li- live a, a, a long time. In his mid sixties, he died, and she actually interred him with um, with her husband at the, the cemetery. In fact, um, if you you know, not far from the the uh, old Mormon fort is you know Las Vegas's oldest cemetery, and this is actually where um, you know where the Stewart family is buried, right down the hill here. In fact, my grandparents are buried, um, you know, right here, right next to where Helen J. Stewart and her family are uh, are resting now. So you know, education it was always a very very big concern, and in fact, as as um, Helen J. Stewart got money and started making money uh she devoted some of that money to uh education and sent her kids down to la for for that i also want to talk about helen's social life and, and what she did again she really didn't like to be alone um she really missed the company of women um but she also was able to make a uh a special friendship with uh with jim wilson up at red rock canyon so you know they for years they were uh their families would get together uh they would have picnics together they would spend holidays together and things like that and we actually found out that helen uh and jim wilson had a romantic connection um now helen's son Hiram her number two son he really did not approve of Helen disrespecting the memory of 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 um, his father and so this was actually kind of a secret relationship uh, it was usually when the boys were away uh, that they would get together and uh, you know we actually find Helen's initials carved up in the uh, sandstone uh, behind Jim Wilson's house here uh, we also find in her diaries that Helen was afraid of getting pregnant so, you know, I, I'm just it's kind of cute that Helen had her romance here in the desert, her hidden romance that she had to keep hidden away from her children. And later in her life, uh, she actually wrote this poem and I, I want to read it. Uh, I don't know if it was written about Jim Wilson, but I don't know. You think about it. If you've been up here to Spring Mountain uh, State Park and you've gone out here, here's where the Super Summer Theater thing happens. Um, I don't know. I just want you to hear this this poem. Think about Jim Wilson and, and maybe they're related. Hear the pine birds sing. Hear the echoes sweetly ring. Fountains dark and sparkling or the fern beds darkening. Come to me, your warrior bold with feet so light and heart of gold. In his fastness here, the mountain deer has not from you nor I to fear. Come over the mountain to your lover true. Come, my mountain flower, come, O dew. O linger not for the storms so cold. May delay us, may delay for us in danger hold. Come to the valley to your own true love. Come to the home of the nesting dove. I'll care ever and guard your sweetheart till the great spirit calls us to part. In the desert land of the blue sage, where the rock bowl is the rain gauge, where the dry earth kisses the rainbow sweet, there, my dear, we will meet. So I like that. I I don't know. I think I really do think that was about Jim Wilson, especially her the line about come to me, your warrior bold. He was a soldier down at the at the, at the fort and all these things. Then again, maybe maybe totally not. Maybe I'm wrong, but I like to think about that. So, again, Helen was kind of rocking it in Las Vegas. She was succeeding where uh, where gas and where uh, the Mormons had failed. And she was actually um, uh, developing a bit of wealth. Uh, she learned that the uh, railroad was going to be coming through town. And so she decided to start investing money in land. And she started buying up all the land, especially that had water underneath it, because she knew that those um, <laughs> that those steam engines uh, would need the, would need that water. And she she told her children, she this is something she said, she, she often told her children to be patient and that civilization would catch up with them. She spoke of, and I think this is a great 
uh, a great prophecy. Seeing the glint of the rails, the smoke of the trains, and homes and church spires in the grain fields on the hill. So she had a vision of Las Vegas, uh, you know, back when there were just a couple dozen um, non-native settlers in Las Vegas. Uh, she had a vision for what this would become. And if you look at it now, you know, it's this, it's, it's this culturally relevant city in the middle of the desert with, you know, two and a half million people in it. And, you know, she made that call really early. She also became the postmaster and, you know, uh, and her little ranch was the post office for, for years. Um, and her sons were able to start pitching in. So William at 12 years old, they say he would start taking these solo trips. They'd take all this valuable cargo down to El Dorado Canyon. Uh, and her other son, uh, Hiram, he was the rancher. So he was always, you know, there with the, uh, with the native Americans and on his horse and, and running around chasing horses and cattle and things like that. So Helen had really, um, come into her home and this, you know, this, this was starting to make money and be a successful endeavor. Now I do want to talk about this picture real quick. Just, this is the old Helen J. Stewart ranch house. And out here on this horse that you see running by, you know, that's Las Vegas Boulevard now. And I just, again, looking at the, uh, you know, her prophecy and then thinking about what Las Vegas is now, I would love, love to see what she would think if we were able to take her out of her front door, lead her onto Las Vegas Boulevard and, and, and walk her down the street and show what, what this city has become. I think she would be, I wonder what she would think of it. Um, so one of the things that, that Helen did, again, I, I said, we, was she sent her kids to school. And I do want to tell one fun story about her kids going to school. So they lived right. We actually have the address and everything of where they lived. They lived right downtown Los Angeles on Hill Street, uh, right across from Angels Knoll, um, you know, right downtown. And this is where her, um, you know, the, she sent her two daughters and, and um, Archie down. Her older two boys they were pretty much feral. They did not take very well to the, uh, to the other teacher either. And, you know, they were doing their thing. They were farming and, and ranching and really didn't see a giant, uh, value in education. Um, but so, but she sent her, uh, her three, uh, youngest, uh, children down to Las Vegas. And, you know, so here's Tiza, uh, her oldest, and here's Eva, and and Archie and Archie actually, he was a rambunctious little kid. He got in a little bit of trouble. In fact, he showed up in the newspaper <laughs> down in Los Angeles. Uh, this this was from the Los Angeles Record and talked about how Archie, um, you know, at twelve years old, he got um, he got separated from his friends. So one of his friends said, "Hey, let's go to Pasadena." Not, and Archie didn't realize Pasadena is like ten miles away. Uh, so they go to Pasadena and they get separated. And Archie doesn't know how to get home. He didn't have any money. Um, you know, in the in the news report here, it, it, it talks about how um, you know he was lying and wanted to go to Las Vegas and all this kind of stuff. But the reality was, you know, he found the local sheriff. Uh, the the local sheriff. He he said, "Hey, I'm stuck here. Um, here's where my sisters." live so they they sent word to them and so uh you know his sisters came and picked him up in the morning but uh you know really funny that that he got lost and and you know the way he was talking and the way that this reporter heard what was said you know archie wasn't afraid of walking home he would you know if he was stuck in las vegas it didn't matter he could walk home or i mean if he was stuck in pasadena it didn't matter he could walk home to las vegas <laughs> and it just shows how independent spirited uh you know these stewart kids were now, a couple of years after sending the kids to school, you know, something pretty sad happens. Um, in 1899, we were, we're really lucky to have this picture. There are not a lot of pictures of the Stewart family, as you can imagine. Uh, they were out in the middle of nowhere, away from civilization. But somebody got a camera and took a picture of Archie when he was around 14 years old. And unfortunately, he would never see his 15th birthday. Um, Archibald, he unfortunately was out riding his horse, chasing some wild, um, some wild horses outside of, uh, the ranch and he fell and died. And so I just can't imagine how rough this was. Well, I kind of can, but Helen J. Stewart had to, um, you know, she had to bury this Archibald next to her old, uh, you know, her husband and she had lost, you know, two people that she really loved, uh, you know, in this quest to make. So Helen had lost you know, two people, uh, to make Las Vegas work. 
it was uh i don't know really sad and she put him uh alongside his old teacher and his his father in that little family plot and it was it was a really 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 heartbreaking for helen in fact uh you know we have some of the um uh messages and some of the letters that helen wrote to her daughter about just how sad that that she was about losing uh her son you know i lost a brother uh, to a skateboard accident when he was in his 20s and and that was just you know devastating i i can't imagine losing your husband and then losing your son as well especially a son that she'd put so many resources into that she'd you know made sure to be educated and was just just her favorite and to to lose him must have been absolutely de devastating and again he's he's interred here at uh at the the family plot uh and you know just what a sad sad time for helen now a year later something else interesting happened and this is going to be the last story we tell of helen j stewart in this first half of her life um you know something happens at the kyle ranch so this is a picture um, that, that was taken a, a few years later, but I want to talk about the, the main protagonists of the story are these two gentlemen on the left. This is Frank Stewart. He was actually one of the ranch hands, um, not related to Helen in any way, just happened to have the same last name. He would actually end up being her second husband a little bit later. And then William, her oldest, um, one day in, in, uh, in 1900, so really not that long ago, was not the days that we think of vigilante justice happening, these two gentlemen decided to go and visit the Kyle ranch and the Kyle brothers, the, um, you know, the Kyle father, he had passed away already. Um, but there were two Kyle brothers still living there. And, um, well, they didn't live after that day. Uh, they were, they were killed. Uh, and I believe it was by Frank and, and William. In fact, if you go to the mob museum right now, there's this interesting display. Uh, Helen J. Stewart wrote a letter talking about um, the death of, of the two um, of the two Kyle brothers. And what Helen says is that it was a murder suicide. In fact, that was the story for the, the longest time is that there must have been a disagreement between the Kyles and, you know, they killed each other. Um, but you know, they actually had to reinter their bones, uh, the bodies later in the seventies. And when they did that, UNLV, uh, actually studied them and realized that the caliber of bullets and the wounds that they found, um, were not compatible with the, the kinds of weapons that the Kyles had at the time. Uh, but they were compatible with the kind of weapons that the, uh, stewards had. So, you know, through forensics, we learned that, um, that this was probably some sort of a revenge killing or, or I'm, I'm not sure if it was for the killing of their father of Archibald Stewart, or if it was for other grievances and things that, that happened over the years. Um, but you know, 20 years after they had moved in together and being the only neighbors, uh, you know, around the only people in Las Vegas, uh, it came to a bloody end. And I wonder, I wonder how, how much Helen knew about that. I wonder how much Helen was involved or, uh, uh, you know, if she did think it was really a murder suicide or if she knew that her her son and her soon to be husband, uh, new husband had uh, exacted that revenge. It's interesting because, again, to make it out here in Las Vegas, you have to be a protagonist. You, you have to be a, a pragmatist. You have to be realistic about what's going on. And, you know, and having that justice stripped away from her and she wrote in so many letters about how much that affected her, the fact that she, you know, she was, uh, that justice was not served for her husband's death. And then all these years later at 1900, right before Helen J. Stewart would go on to do some other amazing things, uh, you know, th this kind of uh, frontier justice happened. And I think, think it was very, very interesting. And so that's where we're going to take a break for today. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, story of one of the, the most amazing people who ever lived in Las Vegas. And she's going to go on to do even more amazing things. We're going to talk about, you know, the 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 corrupt, awful senator, the super rich guy that she has to go toe to toe with next. And then how Las Vegas almost slips back into the desert and, um, you know, the early days of, of Las Vegas and what she does to make sure that it's a real town uh, uh, and not just a, a company, just not just a railroad stop somewhere. And. I don't know. I think Las Vegas, uh, Helen J. Stewart is a name that we should all know. And we should also be proud of how she was able to make it where so many hadn't. So again, I'm Alan Rogers and thank you for listening.